Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to talk about one man, and we're going to talk about his meaning in history. We're going to talk about Jeremiah Jerry Denton, who died recently at the age of 89. And I could talk about a lot of his accomplishments. He graduated from the Naval Academy with honors and became one of the Navy's top aviators, including winning the Navy Cross. In 1981, he was elected to the Senate and became the first... Republican Senator since Reconstruction, and the other military honors he won included three silver stars, two purple hearts, and a distinguished flying cross. And all of that's besides being a good father and husband. But his role in history began in July of 1965, and here's a little bit of the beginning of the story. On July 18, 1965, then Commander Denton was flying an A-6 intruder on a bombing run over the Vietnamese city of Than Hoi. His plane was shot down and he was captured by enemy forces. Admiral Denton was a Vietnam POW for nearly eight years, four of which were spent in solitary confinement. Well, let me expand a little bit on that. As one of the first pilots shot down in the Vietnam War, Commander Denton was immediately paraded before North Vietnamese villagers and was taken to the notorious Hanoi Hilton. The treatment at the Hanoi Hilton in the early years of the war from 1966 through 1969 has been documented, and we'll go through some of that. But it should be noted that Commander Denton was one of the leaders of the American forces there because he was a ranking officer along with James Stockdale. The Hanoi Hilton was a dilapidated old French prison for Vietnamese prisoners, and it was used by the North Vietnamese for the American POWs. Denton and Stockdale received among the worst treatment because they were leaders. They were located in what was called Alcatraz, the worst part of the Hanoi Hilton. Nevertheless, there they worked out codes of communication for all the American POWs, which included a tapping system and a system of coughing and sneezing. Most importantly, they worked out the code of conduct. What every American POW in the Hanoi Hilton should and should not do, what information they should not give up, and how they should behave in front of their captors. The North Vietnamese quickly picked up on the fact that Jeremiah Denton was one of the leaders and also one of the most recalcitrant American POWs, and they decided to use him in a propaganda press conference in front of Japanese interviewers in May of 1966. They knew that he would not participate willingly, so let me read to you a little bit of what they did to him from a recent book called Defiant by Elvin Towley, the story of the POWs in the Hanoi Hilton. By April 20, 1966, Jerry's leadership and general stubbornness, particularly his persistent refusal to sign a confession admitting his crimes, had earned him a visit with Big Eye in room 19 of the Hanoi Hilton. Inside, Jerry watched the practice torturer efficiently stack two four-legged stools, one on top of the other. Then Big Eye helped Jerry to the top of the stack, a precarious five feet above the tile floor, and annoyingly close to the single light bulb that lit the room. Cups bound his hands behind his back, and then Pig Eye left. Hours passed, nobody entered the room. Jerry sat balanced atop the stool, staring straight ahead. More hours passed. Discomfort began growing in his legs and back, increasing by the minute. The setup prevented Jerry from sleeping, forcing him to endure the burning bulb throughout the first night and the second day. He was offered neither food nor water. The hours passed with excruciating slowness, and Jerry's mind began suffering as much as his body. Sometime during the second night, the plaster knobs on the walls became faces. Jerry's weary eyes and sleep-deprived brain conspired to render devils and angels from them. The devil screamed, the angels sang. Jerry realized his companions were hallucinations, so he held tightly to one coherent and driving thought. He would choose death from starvation over writing a confession. Somehow he struggled through that second night atop the stools. Then he forced himself to ignore the cries of his empty belly throughout the third night. Still he could not sleep. On the third night he received a visit from Rabbit, the English-speaking political officer. He seemed to hope that this slow torture and sleep deprivation had softened his cagey prisoner. Well, Denton still refused to sign any confessions or admit to any war crimes. The next day, Pig Eye, the most cruel of the North Vietnamese tortures, retrieved him and brought him to room 18. He cuffed Jerry's wrists behind him, then began pounding Jerry's face and body with his fists. Jerry tried to take the blows without emotion, without falling, but he could not. The punches sent him spinning around the room and tumbling to the floor again and again. Another guard would drag him to his feet, and Pig Eye would simply resume the beating. Every punch and every drop of blood that flowed from his nose fueled Jerry's anger and resolve. He caught his breath as Pig Eye repositioned him on the floor. He noticed rope in Pig Eye's arms as the torturer pulled down his subject's sleeves. Jerry knew it would come and planned to lose his arms before his honor. The two guards began lacing his upper arms with rope, digging their feet into Jerry's back to pull the ropes tight against the muscle and the bone. 
The tightening ropes quickly cut off circulation to his lower arms and hands. Starved for oxygen, his muscles desperately tried to keep alive by converting stored sugars and starches to acid, which an conditioned pig eye would soon use to great effect. Pig eye and the other guard began cinching Jerry's upper arms closer together. His shoulders began to strain. His sternum seemed likely to crack. His chest bowed backwards almost unbelievably. The terrible sensation surpassed anything he had known. He wanted it to stop, but Pig Eye had more. The guards worked Jerry's bound upper arms closer together until his elbows touched. Excruciating pain shot from his arms until they became numb. At that point, Pig Eye loosened the ropes. Jerry's arteries rushed blood back into his lower starved arms. The built-up acid strangled tissue poisoned the reawakened nerve endings, creating a condition called allodynia and making Jerry feel a blinding pins and needles sensation. But Jerry did not submit. Now sweating from the effort, Pig Eye placed a long concrete iron filled bar across his captive's ankle. Two guards slipped off their sandals and balanced themselves on the bar barefoot, rolling it along Jerry's legs. Pig Eye occasionally paused and gazed into Jerry's eyes to gauge his lucidity. Okay, he asked. Jerry spat back, okay, and the guards continued rolling the bar across his shins. Next, they grabbed the cuffs that still bound Jerry's arms behind his back. They lifted his arms skyward, nearly tearing the muscles from Jerry's shoulder sockets. They alternated between these methods until their victim began crying uncontrollably. He prayed to black out. He wished for the relief it would bring, but Pig Eye would not allow him the luxury of escape. He knew how to keep prisoners lucid enough to experience unabated pain. He'd take them to the brink of passing out, then ease up. When Jerry closed his eyes and feigned unconsciousness, Pig Eye just lifted his eyelids and grinned. Jerry eventually reached a point where instinct began overpowering conscious thought. Pain consumed his mind. He would do anything to end this agony. Conscious only of his desire to escape the present, he wished her bow cow, bow cow, the Vietnamese words for to report or to submit, which the camp authority required POWs to use. Jerry capitulated, and then Pig Eye allowed him to pass out. Well, three weeks later, here's what happened at the first interview of an American POW before a Japanese journalist. During the questioning, Admiral Denton looked into the camera lens and blinked his eyes in Morse code, spelling out the message, torture. He provided naval intelligence with a first confirmation that American POWs in Vietnam were being tortured. And although that was heroically amazing, what he said next probably put him at greater risk in the days following the press conference. How do we have access to the people in the camp? I get uh, adequate food and adequate clothing and medical care when I require it. How do you think about uh, the so-called Vietnamese law? Do you think that's about? Well, I don't know what uh, is happening. But uh, whatever the position of my government is, I support it fully. Well, whatever the position of my government is, I believe in it. Yes, sir. I am a member of that government. It's my job to support it, and I will as long as I live. In case you didn't get that last part, he said, my job is to support and I will as long as I live. You can imagine what kind of beatings and torture that brought him for the next three years. By 1969, peace talks had begun, the status of the prisoners had changed, and there were so many more American prisoners at the Hanoi Hilton. Prisoners were allowed contact with each other, and treatment improved somewhat. The wives of the POWs made an important issue about them back in America, and they became pawns in the Paris peace talk negotiation. Meanwhile, Jeremiah Dent was one of the four wise men, the men who set the policy for the American POWs, and he managed to keep them together as a unit for the rest of the war. In January 1973, with the war winding down, it was announced that the POWs would be coming home. Between that announcement and before they came home, here is Jane Fonda at a speech on January 29, 1973, at UC Berkeley to the students. This is why Nixon is now back at the negotiating tables. This is one of the reasons why, and he can no longer hold over the heads of the Vietnamese. If you don't bow to our demands, we will bomb your cities with B-52s. Because according to the visitors who were there during the bombing, what happened in the streets? Yes, the people were being bombed, but they continued laughing, they continued singing, they continued treating their American guests with humanity and hospitality, they continued to go about their work, and Christmas Day, they evacuated in a good scientific fashion 400,000 people in 24 hours from Hanoi. Imagine trying to do that from this country, from any city in this country. It speaks well for socialism. They knew, as they knew when they fought the French, that the GI was going to turn against the war and become their ally. And from the very beginning of the war against the Americans, they always educated their people. Yes, we have to fight the GIs, but we don't hate them. 
We don't hate the pilots. When they're in the air bombing, they are war criminals. When they're on the ground, they are human beings. And it's one of the things that, that explains why they treat pilots the way they do. You know, Jane Fonda supposedly had a change of heart from that time she was sitting on that gun turret in North Vietnam. But I just want to play a fairly recent interview she had with Larry King. There are some people who are, like, stuck there. You know, they're still f stuck in the past. I always want to say, get a life, or, you know, read what really happened. You know, the, the, the myths are not true. Listener can draw his own conclusions on that. Anyway, Jeremiah Denton, a couple of weeks later, became the first POW to step off an airplane onto the Philippine soil and make a statement to the American public. On February 12, 1973, Denton was released from prison along with numerous other POWs. He was a spokesman for the first returning group of POWs. And as he stepped from the plane, he was asked to make a statement on behalf of the group. We are honored to have the opportunity to save our country under difficult circumstances. We are profoundly grateful to our commander-in-chief and to our nation for this day. God bless America. A few years later, President Ronald Reagan paid a special tribute to Jeremiah Denton. We don't have to turn to our history books for heroes. They're all around us. One who sits among you here tonight epitomized that heroism at the end of the longest imprisonment ever inflicted on men of our armed forces. Who will ever forget that night when we waited for television to bring us the scene of that first plane landing at Clark Field in the Philippines, bringing our POWs home? The plane door opened. Jeremiah Denton came slowly down the ramp. He caught sight of our flag, saluted it, said, God bless America, and then thanked us for bringing him home. Well, as long as Jane Fonda wants to talk about what really happened, I thought I'd read you an excerpt from Townley's book about Jeremiah Denton's final debriefing with one of his captors named Mickey Mouse before he left the Hanoi Hilton. When Jerry's term came, Mickey Mouse, who had overseen so many interrogations in Alcatraz and the Hilton, asked how he would describe the, his experience when he returned to America. I haven't answered your questions this long, Jerry replied. Why should I answer you now? Why do you care what I say anyhow? There are hundreds of men who will speak when they get home. But you have credibility, Denton, Mickey Mouse said. What do you expect? Don't you know I'll tell about the torture? Yes, we expect that. So why do you want me to tell you what I will say? We are afraid when you get home and make speech, Mr. Nixon will not give us aid he promised, Mickey Mouse explained. Public would not allow. I will say that through 1969, you treated me and the others worse than animals, Jerry answered. Yes, but is that all? Denton said, no, that is not all. Late in 1969, you came off the torture. After that, to my knowledge, you did not resort to extreme punishment. You then acted within your conscience, such as it is. Mickey Mouse then said, that's the truth, but others may not tell the truth. Denton said, if there's any exaggeration, the senior officers will take care of that. Then, as Jerry rose to leave, the North Vietnamese officer, who had been his hated adversary, stood with him and said earnestly, Denton, you're a good man. And that remark left Jerry speechless. I wonder if Jane Fonda knows that story. In that respect, I'm going to close with a poem by Charles M. Province, a veteran and a military writer. It is the soldier, not the reporter, who has given us freedom of the press. It is the soldier, not the poet, who has given us freedom of speech. It is the soldier, not the campus organizer, who has given us the freedom to demonstrate. It is the soldier who salutes the flag, who serves beneath the flag, and whose coffin is draped by the flag, who allows the protester to burn the flag. Well, I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. And before we close with our closing song, I'd like to take note that when Jerry Denton received the exact time that the POWs would be removed from the prison, he made sure that they marched out in military formation and exited like soldiers. As they were exiting, one of the airmen noticed something that one of the other airmen had carved into a wall in one of the cells at the Hanoi Hill. It said simply, Freedom has a taste to those who fight and almost die that the protected will never know. I will leave you with that thought and the song that Jeremiah Denton should forever be associated with, sung by the man who wrote it, Irving Berlin. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. God bless America, my home sweet.